Okay, what have we got today? What's going on? What's this about? We're talking about my favourite subject. Black holes. Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was going to be friends. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not friends, it's not Taylor Swift, and it's not Hamilton, sorry. Right. Uh, it's black holes. <laughs> and I want to ask you, Brady, what do you think is the most massive black hole that we know of? The biggest. How big do you reckon it is? 10 billion suns. <laughs> 10, 10 billion suns. 10 billion solar mass. I imagine it's one of those ones that's at the center of a really big galaxy. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's a super massive black hole. Yeah. It's obviously one of the biggest we found. Uh, and 10 billion, be between friends, I'll give you that. It's okay. 66 billion times the mass of the sun right. is the biggest super massive black hole we found. It's monstrously large. So the Milky Way's black hole at the center of our galaxy is 4 million times the mass of the sun. The supermassive black hole at the center of Messier 87 that we had the image of back in 2019, 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. TON 618, supermassive black hole, 66 billion times the mass of the sun. Bigger than the entire mass of everything in the Milky Way, but crushed down into a space that's smaller than the solar system. Like it's, it, we needed a new name for it. People have started calling it an ultra massive black hole. When we talk about the size of a black hole, we're talking about the size of the event horizon. So the point of no return, essentially, the sort of sphere around that singularity that is the part where we're no longer getting any more light from, getting no information from, no data from. If you crossed it, you'd become a cropper, you'd never come back out again. Question is, can it get any bigger? Is there a upper limit to how big black holes can grow? And you might think, well, no, black holes will just pull everything and anything in, but that's not how what we call the accretion process works. So accretion is like a, a fancy physics word, essentially, to mean bring in under gravity. You think, well, black holes have the strongest gravity, surely they can just bring stuff in. But we have to remember that most material, when you've got a massive object, will just orbit an object. So to get stuff to go from being in orbit to not being in orbit and actually falling in towards the black hole, you'd have to somehow remove energy from it. Maybe a cloud of gas, very unsuspecting, <laughs> comes in towards a black hole and it gets turned from, you know, like a, a sphere into essentially a disk. And in that disk, that's where you've got all of these collisions going on and eventually some of the stuff will collide, lose energy and spiral in towards the black hole. So when we think about this process happening, there's a couple of different things we have to think about. Almost like different circles that we could draw around the black hole. We already heard about one of them, that was the event horizon. That's one sphere that you could draw around the black hole is that point of no return. Another circle you can draw is called the innermost stable circular orbit. ISCO. The ISCO essentially is the point where you can have a, a stable orbit around the black hole, which doesn't really check out if we think about gravity the way that Newton thought about it. Say you had something in orbit around the sun, like very close to its surface in a perfectly circular orbit, nudge it slightly to send it onto an elliptical orbit, it could do that. It could change its orbit and shift it slightly to be elliptical orbit rather than a perfect circle and still stay around the sun rather than falling in. In Einstein's theory of gravity, there is a point at which you can't do that anymore. You have a last stable circular orbit. You cannot adjust your orbit in any way. If you've been nudged and lost energy, at that point, the only way is down. You're right on the, it's the, you're right on the edge of survival. Exactly right. So the ISCO is usually, it defines the innermost point of what we call that accretion disk, that disk of essentially hydrogen gas, swirling matter around the black hole that hopefully will fall in and grow the black hole's mass. So that's how the majority of black holes grow. Sometimes you can have a merger of two black holes. So for example, if you have two galaxies that merge together, the supermassive black holes in the center will also presumably merge. But mergers aren't very common. They're quite rare. They happen over billions of years. For example, like Andromeda and the Milky Way will merge, but in four or five billion years time, they'll meet and it'll probably take another few billion years for their black holes to finally slosh together and eventually merge. So in the rest of the time, it's this accretion process that's driving the growth. So both the event horizon and the ISCO, that sphere that you draw around a black hole, that gets bigger and bigger with mass. So like we were talking about before, the event horizon, the bigger the black hole, the bigger that pushes out. Same with the innermost stable circular orbit. 
And the self-gravitational radius, another circle or sphere you can draw around the black hole, is essentially why we have a galaxy of stars around the supermassive black hole in the centre in the first place. It's the radius beyond which, say you have a star, the gravity of the star holding the star together is stronger than the pull that it feels from the black hole. If you didn't have that, we wouldn't have a galaxy of stars, right? We'd just have a big accretion disk and it's just all hydrogen gas, just hundreds of thousands of light years wide, all waiting to go out into the black hole. You couldn't have structures. Exactly, right? you couldn't have structures at all if you didn't have this self-gravitational radius. Andrew King, who is a professor at Leicester, was thinking about this back in 2015. And he realized actually that as you grow bigger and bigger, there is a point at which that innermost stable circular orbit goes beyond the self-gravitational radius. So the edge of your accretion disk is at the point where all of the stuff in the accretion disk is attracted more to each other than it is to the black hole. So no matter how many collisions they have to exchange energy, they will never actually cross that innermost stable circular orbit and end up into the black hole. So any gas that you bring into orbit around the black hole is more like to start clumping into itself and hopefully get very dense and maybe kickstart star formation. Or, I don't know, in some planetary system <laughs> around a black hole or something like that, right? That's the more likely thing to happen than for this accretion process where the black hole grows. And so you realize that there's therefore this limit almost at which a black hole can't grow by this process anymore. The only way it could grow is if it had a merger with another one, or if you had material on, on literally like the bullseye trajectory, right? Like straight down into the black like hole. Like a then. freak collision. Yeah, exactly. So it would be very, very rare. And if you work out how big that is, that limit at which point the ISCO goes beyond the self-gravitational radius, it's around about 50 billion times the mass of the sun, which obviously is smaller than TON 618 at 66 billion. But it's because you've taken, it's a lot of assumptions to get the maths. To do it, you assume the black hole is not spinning, which if the black hole is spinning, it does change things slightly and it can push that higher. How high is debated, could be up to 60, could be up to 70 billion times the mass of the sun. But it still doesn't change the fact that TON 618 at 66 billion times the mass of the sun is getting towards that limit. It's reaching the point where it can't grow through accretion anymore, through that disk around it. And the thing is, those disks around it, they're the things that glow in X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, so that we can see these things billions of years across the universe. And we can also measure that the supermassive black hole's masses with the light from that disk as well. So the idea that it might be reaching its peak suggests that there could already be other black holes in the universe that have already reached their peak that we can no longer see and know that they're there or measure how heavy they are and that we could be living through this era of sort of the end of black holes. It's like they've retired. Yes, yeah, it's like they've gone dormant finally like a volcano, you know, or something like that. Which is exciting to think about that we could be living through that era of you know, black holes reaching the maximum they can grow to, but also kind of sad. Can the Milky Way's whopper of a black hole reach this limit? Like, has it got enough food or will it, will it never get to that kind of proportion? So the Milky Way's black hole is pretty piddly, not just because it's only four million times the mass of the sun, but there is a correlation as well, a rough correlation between the total mass in stars in a galaxy and the total mass in the black hole. And so you see this sort of as a nice correlation, nice line, and a lot of galaxies, you know, scatter around this line. The Milky Way's black hole is quite far below it. Like you'd expect it to be much larger for the size of the galaxy than it is. Now this could be the reason that we're all here, because if it's not grown very much through this accretion process that can actually, you know, throw out a lot of high energy radiation, can sometimes get pressure building in that accretion disk and it sort of gives off a little burp of an outflow, as we call it, or a jet. And that can radiate through the galaxy and it could have serious issues for life on any planet. So the fact that Milky Way's black hole is small because it's not grown could be the reason why we were given a nice, safe place to evolve over the past four, five billion years or so. So that's an interesting thought. But because it's so small, I mean, yes, it has the theoretical ability to grow that big, just whether it will or not is a question. To become like TON618, it would probably need five, ten more mergers of galaxies all coming together. It's likely that what TON618 is, is what we call a, a galaxy cluster fossil. 
So essentially you had a cluster of galaxies in the past, say 10 galaxies all clumped together, and they've all merged together into one over the universe's history. And that's likely what's formed this giant behemoth of a galaxy and ultra massive black hole. Galaxy cluster fossil. Yeah. You guys are the best at naming stuff. <laughs> All the right. GCF, really, if we're doing what we actually want to do, right? <laughs> this is your book about black holes. Yes. It's in. You can buy it in America now as well, can't you? Can, you can, yeah. It's out worldwide now, so wherever you are, you should be able to get a copy. Uh, you can get it in hardback, or I also did the audiobook version as well, so you can have me read it to you, if will, you like. Will you sign mine? Yeah, of course will. There we go. <laughs> oh, wow. Go on, read it for us. It says, to Brady, thanks for giving me my start on YouTube, Dr. Becky, November 2022. <laughs> now, I want one more thing. Yeah? I, I want you to draw a black hole for me. Draw <laughs> a black hole, yeah. okay. <laughs> how, do you, how do you draw a black hole? Um, I guess a little bit like how they had it in Interstellar, for everyone who's, who's seen it, is you get the light bent around it, right? And then you have this right. accretion disk. So that is the accretion disk of material, there's sort of the event horizon, the shadow where you're no longer getting any light, and then that's the light of the accretion disk from behind it, bent around the top of the black hole. Nice, <laughs> I like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and there's the name of the book, everyone. Link yeah. in the description. Yeah. <laughs> where we think there's that starburst that's taking place. The fact that it's not is really interesting. For spiral galaxies, we expect them to be very blue and very star-forming. Blue light essentially means the hottest, brightest, biggest stars 